Very good morning, family in Jesus. Praise be to the Lord God Almighty for this beautiful day and for the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Word of God. If you want to follow in the Word of God this morning, we will be reading out of Matthew 16. And the Lord is going to show us something so precious, so beautiful this morning in the Word of God. So what the Lord is going to show us this morning out of the Word of God is how fragile we as humans actually are. And even though you are uh, following Christ and even though you are anointed and baptized by the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, we as human beings can sometimes still be very fragile. And through disobedience, we can move away from the Lord through not hearing uh, God's voice clearly. We can do and say things that are outside of the Word of God, but we're going to get into this beautiful scripture this morning, and the, the, the Word of God is going to bless us um, in showing us how we can overcome this and not to be fragile in His kingdom. Before we get into the Word of God, let us all pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your Word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the gift to be able to be in a country where it is still free, Lord, to open your word and to minister your word, where we can still have church. We thank you, Father God, that in this time that you have helped us to make a plan, Lord Jesus, to be able to get to one another with the word of God. And we thank you for that, Father God. We pray, Lord, right now for this message, that the Holy Spirit will take complete control of my, my words, my tongue, and, and that the, the Holy Spirit will minister the, the, the truth of the word of God to us this morning and that it will fall on good soil, shoot roots and grow to produce fruit according to your will and your word so that we will be able to build your kingdom effectively and edify your people every single day. And we thank you for that Father God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. We pray and we ask this in Jesus name. Amen. So, um, this scripture this morning in Matthew 16 is going to show us, as I said, how fragile we as human beings are and, and how easy it, it is for us to change our minds from faith to fear. It's in a split second it happens. And that is why we must always be connected to the Holy Spirit, listening to the Holy Spirit. Um, but yet there, there comes times in our lives that we still stay human. And it's not a, an excuse not to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. It's unfortunately just who we are and how we are. And we can see that straight through the Word of God. So we can, we can see it in the life of David. We've spoken about this over and over again. I, I just feel the Lord wants us to rehash it this morning, um, just to bring it uh, up again back to our minds so that we can mull around with it and, and get to the absolute truth of what the Lord wants to say to us this morning. So if we go into the Word of God and we have a look at David, um, David was anointed as king, he was sent out and was placed in front as a boy, placed in front of this massive giant that None, none of the Israelite soldiers, the trained, educated, qualified soldiers, wanted to face this giant. And this boy stands in front of him and he takes out a rock, puts it in a sling, and hits him between the eyes. The giant falls, he walks over to him, takes his own sword and chops his head off. Victory through Father God. Then right there, he leaves and he is employed in um, the, the, the palace of, of Saul. And Saul tries to kill him and David flees from him. He run, runs away. So the anointing was still there, but fear took over the anointing. David took a few of his men and they ran away and, and they went and, and they lived in caves. Hiding from King Saul until he eventually died. We can see it with one of the most powerful prophets ever to walk on this earth, Elijah. Elijah is up on the mountain and he has challenged 400 Baal prophets. He calls down fire from heaven. 
to consume his offering with the water around his offering and the rocks of the altar. He then goes ahead under the anointing of the Lord and slaughters 400 Baal prophets. Now, have you ever thought about the strength that Elijah must have had to be able single-handedly to slaughter 400 Baal prophets? That man must have been massive. He must have been powerful. I'm talking about physically. And then, covered with the anointing of God, he must have been absolutely unstoppable. The Bible even teaches us that he was so fast that he ran ahead of chariots. That's how physically strong Elijah, the prophet, was. So he slaughters 400 Baal prophets. He comes down from that victory off of that mountain. And a woman named Jezebel threatens to kill him. And he flees, runs away, and goes and hides in a cave. How fragile are we as people not when it comes to fear? Now in this time that we are in, I have had numerous phone calls and texts from our church family with people that have fear. Fear about what's happening now and fear about what is going to happen. Just, just con controlling fear in their lives. Not at that moment concentrating on the anointing or the calling that the Lord has given them. But immediately concentrates when they open their eyes in the morning on this fear that is now in their lives or that is maybe not at the moment in their lives but that they are thinking could come in the future. And again, we can see it straight through the Word of God, how fragile we as human beings are. Because again, David goes and, and he conquers this giant. And eventually, when Saul is dead, he is declared as king and is put on the throne until one day he walks to his window and we all know the story further. He sees a beautiful woman bathing. And right there, David is fragile. And takes away what God has placed in him and over him. Now we can see this straight through the word of God. We can name them over and over and over. Gideon. The first time we read about Gideon, Gideon is a trained soldier, an Israelite soldier, hiding like a coward in a wine press because he is afraid. And an angel of the Lord appears to him and calls him a mighty warrior, the anointing and the calling. And then Gideon stands up and goes, and takes that anointing and that calling and starts working with it. So again, we can see how fragile we as humans are. We are prone to fear. We are prone to sin. We can see it now in these examples that were mentioned. Now, if we get into the word of God this morning, in Matthew 16, from verse 13, I'm going to read through the piece that the Lord gave me to give you as his people this morning. Then we're going to come back and we're going to break it open. And the Holy Spirit is going to show us something powerful this morning. So, Matthew 16 from verse 13. The Bible says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Verse 15. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, 
You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you, Peter, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Verse 19. I will give you keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Then verse 21, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord. He said, This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Now, I, I know that already the Lord has started speaking to us concerning this scripture. This is a powerful scripture in the word of God. So if we go back to verse 13, I'd like to open this up and have the Holy Spirit minister it to our hearts piece by piece. So verse 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others still Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So Jesus walks into this crowd where his disciples are standing, <clears throat> surrounded by non-believers. So first of all, Jesus does not ask the non-believers, who do you say I am? Because he knows what they think about him. Because he's God. So Jesus goes to his disciples, the ones that he is training and raising up to be rabbis so that they can take disciples. So he goes to his disciples and he says to his disciples, these people standing around us, who do they say I am? So he asks the 12 disciples. Then, in verse 14, the 12 disciples answer him quickly. Every one of them is then quick to say, Lord, this one says that you are John the Baptist. That one says that you are Elijah. That one says that, that Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. So they, the disciples are quick to tell Jesus who the other people say he is. Then, verse 15, Jesus says, But what about you? He asked, Who do you say I am? So now Jesus asks the disciples the same question, but not about someone else. So the first time when Jesus asked the disciples, Who do these people say I am? They are quick to answer. They are quick to give an answer for someone else. Then Jesus asks them personally, you as my disciples, who do you say I am? Verse 16, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now, have a look at this. 
Because this happened in the days of Jesus. And this is still happening today. In our churches. Unfortunately. And the Lord has placed me. Especially me. Here on earth. Only to speak the truth of the word of God. And I am not only obligated to speak the truth of the word of God. But I believe I'm anointed to speak the truth of the word of God. As are many of us in our humble church. So what happens here is Jesus asks the disciples, all 12 of them. He had 12 disciples. He asked them, who do you say I am? And out of the 12 disciples, only one answers Jesus. Only one. And we can, again, we can see this in churches. That in a, in a church leader body, you can clearly see it. If you have been blessed to be able to move to a few churches and study how the churches are run, you will see that out of the leader body, you will get one that is always confessing and living who Jesus is permanently. Doesn't matter where they are, doesn't matter what they say, where they go, just like Peter here immediately stands up and confesses. Now, the question is, out of the 12 disciples, we always see here in this piece of scripture that Peter was the one that answered. But we never sit back and think, well, where were the other 11? What were the other 11 disciples thinking and doing at that time? Because here in the Bible, they didn't answer. When Jesus asked the disciples, who do the people say I am? The Bible says in verse 14, they answered. So all the disciples answered. But when Jesus said, and you, who do you say I am? The Bible says in verse 16, that Peter answered. Simon, the other 11 were silent. And unfortunately, today, in churches, that is a huge problem. Is that you will get one that is following what God wants him to follow. But there will be 11 standing and waiting to hear what the next guy says. Um, you know, what do you, how do you think we must do this? Do you think that what he is saying comes from God? Um, I, I first want to see what that guy does or says before I make a move or say something. Now here's the thing that the Lord also showed me about verse 14. They replied, some say you are John the Baptist, some say you are Elijah, some say you are Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Just keep in mind that if you are an anointed man of God, woman of God, this world will never be in confirmation of who you are. They will always have different things to say. And not only the world, because here we can see it in verse 16, that 11 of the 12 disciples remained silent. They didn't answer Jesus. And again, unfortunately, we can see it again in churches today. Worldwide, that there are people that are sitting on the fence. They don't know, must I now follow this man or, or, or must I not? Um, I, I, I first want to hear what these people say because they are they, they, the big people in the church. Or I, I first want to see what these people do or where they go. Unfortunately, that's the truth of life. That happens. And again... That's how fragile we are. Now, have a look at this. <clears throat> Verse 16. Simon Peter answered, 
You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Verse 17, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Now, if you have done any biblical studies, if you have done any theological studies, you will have seen and picked up that the word Simon, the name Simon, means unstable. It means moving sand. So at this very moment, when Jesus asked the disciples, who am I? An unstable man gave the correct answer. Then Jesus goes in verse 18 and says, And I tell you that you are now Peter, the rock on which I will build my church. Because Peter had the revelation from Father God in heaven, Jesus then, through an anointing, promoted him from an unstable unbeliever to the rock that Jesus will build his church on. Here's the other thing that the Lord showed me. Out of the 12 disciples, Peter was the only one that answered and said, Lord, this is who you are. You are the, the living son of God. That's who you are, the Messiah. You are the savior of everything and everyone. And Jesus chose him to change his name from unstable to rock, to something that you can build on permanently. Something that will not move. Something that does not shift or shake, or stumble or fall. And what Jesus is showing us here is, he wants people that he can build his church on that are stable. He does not want people that shift and move around and are undecisive. Jesus wants rocks in his church to build his kingdom on. That is why Jesus went further and said, and I tell you, verse 18, that you are now Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Verse 19, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. He says this to Peter. Now, then something happens to Peter that happens to us in our lives as well. Every single time we as human beings get a promotion, something happens to our minds. Immediately when that promotion comes, we tend to think that we have now arrived. I am the man. I am now untouchable. I am above certain people. Doesn't that happen? It does. Let's be open and honest with ourselves this morning. And this is what happened with Peter. You can only imagine Peter standing in front of the other 11 disciples thinking to himself, Whoa, I'm the man, the son of God chose me above you guys to be the rock, to be the one that he's going to build his church on. And that is what we spoke about the other day in the devotion about position and calling. That is why you will see in churches when people have positions and they climb the ladder because they want to be seen. That's when. There comes a fall, because we can clearly see it here if we go further. Where Simon Peter just went from an unstable man, shifting sand, to be called the rock that Jesus is going to build his, his kingdom on. Then Jesus takes his disciples one side, and he tells them, he prophesies what is going to happen. He takes it out of Elijah, Isaiah. He takes it out of Isaiah. And he says to them, I must go to Jerusalem and I must suffer there. 
and I must be persecuted and killed for all of this to be fulfilled. And at that stage, the rock of the church takes Jesus one side, rebukes him and says, Lord, I will not allow this to happen. And then Jesus calls him. It's the same man that went from unstable to be called unstable, then to be called the rock. Then Jesus says, Jesus did not say to Peter, Peter, you are now being like Satan. No, Jesus referred to Peter as Satan. He said to him that he just called the rock. He said to him, get behind me, Satan. You are making me stumble. Showing us that today, that if you think that you are above something or someone that you are not, and God calls something into your life or the life of your church, and you in flesh try and stop it, if it is anointed by God, this is what happens. You make people in the church stumble. And Jesus took the one that he called, the one is going to build his church on. From an unstable man to a rock to be called Satan. It's the same man. The same man. But he chose at a certain point not to want to be obedient to the prophecy and the voice of Jesus Christ. So Jesus had to do that. And now listen, this also happens. Peter just being promoted to the rock, then heard that Jesus and his followers must suffer. Verse, uh, we, where do we read it? In verse 23. Then Jesus said, um, turn to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. So right after Jesus told Peter and the disciples that he has to suffer and the disciples are going to suffer because of the kingdom of God, because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Peter then rebukes him. And this happens today as well is that a lot of people want to serve Jesus as long as they don't have to suffer. But yet, we read in the book of Galatians that one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is long-suffering. How does that work? Is that all that they want is the rose petals and they want the blessings and they want heaven to open and shower down all the beautiful things on them, but they just don't want to suffer. But yet, in verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciples must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That cross is heavy. It is uncomfortable. It digs into your back and scrapes the skin off of your back. It makes you bleed. It hurts you. We have to suffer in this world for Jesus if we want the pleasure in heaven one day. That's it. Jesus said in the Beatitudes that blessed is he who is persecuted for my name. Blessed are you. Because Jesus said, I, Jesus, had to do it. I had to go through it. Who are you not to go through it? Amen. So this morning, the Lord wants to show us that if I am not willing to go through the suffering, then how can 
I expect to get that promotion in a sense of the anointing that the Lord wants to give me. <clears throat> Jesus was homeless. He was the son of God, but he was homeless. He lived in the desert. He camped outside with his disciples. Jesus suffered. He had to go through it to be able to receive what he has today to be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Nowhere in the Word of God anyone will be able to show you that it says if you serve Jesus, you will not suffer. Nowhere the Word of God says that. It actually says the opposite. It says if you follow me, you will be persecuted. You will be slandered. People will turn on you. The Bible says that families will turn on each other. Mother against daughter, father against son. The Bible is clear in that. And then we must remember today that the Bible clearly teaches us that if you are surrounded with 12 people, that one of them will be a Peter, and for sure, as we are standing here reading the Word of God today, one of them will be a Judas. They will. In every single church that I have ever served in on this earth, in every single church there has been a Judas. Every church, you get them everywhere. And you can recognize them by being the first people to deny that they are Judas. That's also biblical. Because at the Last Supper, when Jesus called out Judas, Judas said, surely it's not me. So you will know them by the amount of times they are trying to cover themselves up. Clear as daylight. Boop! Out there. <laughs> then you can just stand and smile and say, Lord Jesus, bless them. Bless them. Because even Judas fulfilled the plan and the purpose of Jesus. So biblically, there has to be a Judas in our midst. Amen? There has to be a Peter in our midst. The rock on which this whole church stands and is built. That one person that never moves left or right fixes their eyes on Jesus. But just know, brothers and sisters in Christ, there will definitely be a Judas as well. And when they do try and cover themselves up and the Lord reveals it to you, just be kind to them. Just bless them with love. Jesus was never unkind to Judas. Ever. Because he knew he was fulfilling the will of his father. That's all. So today, brothers and sisters, to know with everything inside of you that if you have fear, about anything, to know that it is, it's natural. I, I'm not saying that it is an excuse to move away from the Lord. I'm saying we are human and it's natural. It will happen. But then to seek even harder and longer and more to get back to Jesus so you don't have that fear. So that you can still be called the rock. Whatever the Lord wants to do in your life, Allow him to do it. Don't stand and rebuke it. Sometimes we as people rebuke things that will cause us to move closer to the Lord. Because our, our spiritual ears aren't open at that stage. So things come along like the long suffering. Things happen in our lives that cause us to suffer so that we can grow stronger. Because in God's kingdom, if you go and read in, in Revelations, God does not want cowards in his kingdom. 
God wants people that have got backbone. People that are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. People that are courageous and bold. Jesus wants those disciples in his kingdom. So when, when suffering comes and hardship comes, take it as a school that you are going through and you are being trained by your rabbi, by your master, by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And keep in mind that one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is long-suffering. If, if we did not need to suffer, that would not be a fruit that would be given to us. And long-suffering means to be able to stand through all of this persecution and hardship and sorrow and pain, to still be able to stand. It means perseverance. How many people do you know that persevere through everything and still stick to Jesus? That never denies Him. That never backchats Christ. That never calls Him out and says, Why is this happening in my life? It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Long-suffering. Family in Jesus. We must know this. We must know that this is going to happen. It is biblical. It happened in Jesus' time. If it happened to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, be sure that it's going to happen to you and me. I can write a book of a thousand plus pages testifying about the sufferings that myself and my wife had to endure to get to where we are today. To be able to stand by the anointing of God and say that the Lord has trained us to lead a church effectively. And that through our suffering, we know where not to take the church and we know where to take the church. We know that. 22 years we have suffered for the Lord Jesus. Things that we haven't shared with our family here before. Things that maybe never should be shared. We have rarely chewed hard rocks to be able to be here and serve God's people. To stand and to say that just as you are anointed with your gifts and your talents and your callings, Lord Jesus, Father God has anointed us to be your shepherds and we are here to look out for you, to lead you in the right path, in the right direction and that we will never lead you anywhere we are not willing to go ourselves. Just know that family, I'm not that type of man. So I pray today as we end in prayer right now, that in this new week, the Lord will bless you. If in some part of your, your life at this stage, you are suffering something, to stand up and to say that this is biblical that's happening to me. Because Jesus himself had to suffer. And and you can weigh it up against the word of God. You can weigh it up to see that th is this that I'm going through, is it biblical? Because nothing in our lives will happen that hasn't happened yet in the Bible. I can guarantee you that. Everything that is happening in my life and in your life has somewhere along happened in the Bible. Somewhere along. I do not want the enemy to steal this message and to distort it 
So I am asking before we go into prayer now, if there is anyone that has listened to this message this morning, and there is something that you do not understand, please, in Jesus' name, please contact me. I will gladly sit with you, minister the word of God to you. If something wasn't clear, I will, I will clarify it. But I know standing here this morning that the Holy Spirit gave me this message for us as a church. To stand firm as if we were the rock that Jesus is building his church on. To be bold and not to be cowards. To know that among us there will be a Judas. There is one. There definitely is one. It's biblical. And that when the Judas reveals him or herself, by the way that they are trying to cover up being Judas, just love them. Just love them with the love of Jesus. That's all we can do. Because not knowing it, they are fulfilling God's will as well. So as we go into prayer now, Pray that the Holy Spirit will settle your heart concerning the things that you are going through now that are hardship to you. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will bless you with peace as you are going through it. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, this morning we say that we love you, Lord. We adore you. You are our God and you are our King. We worship you, Father God, with everything inside of us. This morning we lift our hands and our hearts unto you as a gift of thanksgiving, Father God. All we can give you this morning is the little lives that we have, Lord, and the time that we have left here on earth. We pray that you will take our lives and you will make something powerful of it, Lord Jesus. For those of us who are going through hardship right now, that are uncertain about our futures, Lord, that are uncertain about our finances, uncertain about the future of our children. Lord, I pray that you will take those, Lord, and that you will take us, and that you will bless us, Lord Jesus, with the peace of the Holy Spirit, knowing that you are always in control, Lord. You will never leave nor forsake us. You will never lead us into the lion's den, but you will take us out of it, Lord. And we thank you for that, Father God. Lord, may this week be a week where we seek you in your word more and more and more, Lord Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You are good to us and we thank you for that, Father God. I pray for a fresh anointing to rain down on the body of Christ of Altham Baptist Church today, Lord Jesus. I pray a fresh anointing to rain down on every soul in the town of Altham today, Lord Jesus. I pray that the Holy Spirit will cover this town of ours like a blanket. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will remove anything and everything that is not of you, that, that does not bring our Father glory that does not build his kingdom. And I pray that in those void places, that you will, Holy Spirit, fill it with yourself, Jesus. Thank you for this, Father God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We love you, we worship you, we give you glory, honor, praise, and thanks, and we pray and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, family in Jesus. Um, I hope you have a blessed day and and. I, I hope, I truly hope that everything that was said today was um, clear through the Holy Spirit and that Satan didn't steal anything from my lips to your ears. And again, if it feels to you as if that has happened, please contact either Brother Brian or myself. I know Brother Brian will get it to me immediately. Um, we'll, we'll discuss it and... Uh, and, and through that, um, we'll be edified, encouraged, and raise Jesus up as our King. 
So I thank you for that. Again, thank you for this time. Um, I hope it's still a blessing to, to everyone. And I pray you will have a good day and a blessed day in Jesus' name today.